Um, thanks everyone for joining us this evening for Imagining Disaster, um, Science Fiction Times Contemporary Art. Um, my name is Mike and I've produced the programme of the same name, um, which includes new writing, tonight's panel, and also an Instagram takeover, um, which I'll, I'll point you towards more information for at the end. Um, so thanks for joining us this evening. Um, thanks, first of all, to Open Eye Gallery for hosting the event and to Leo for supporting us this evening. Um, and thanks, huge thanks to, to our panel, um, David Blandy, Basma Galayini, and Ogenachevwe Egpeki, um, who will be engaging with, with this idea of science fiction, what it says about now, the contemporary world which we live in and how it challenges issues in that world, um, and also how it relates to um, popular culture um, across literature and contemporary art. Um, I'm going to start this evening with, with David Blandy, who is a contemporary artist who has exhibited internationally. Um, and David's work was kind of amongst the artist's works who kind of served as a bit of a catalyst for me in terms of, you know, seeing people in the contemporary art world, engaging with science fiction and using the ideas and versatility of science fiction to, to communicate their own ideas in, the, in a contemporary art context um, so vividly and so eloquently. Um, so, David, if you'd like to take yourself off mute um, more successfully than I did there, obviously. <laughs> um, and I'd like to talk to you about two of your most recent artworks, really. Um, the, the World After and Lost Eons. Um, the World After was, I think, a 2020 artwork and Lost Eons is um, either late 2020 or, or this year. Is that right, David? Yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think when, uh, they're, they're pretty recent. When did, yeah. when did <laughs> I think Lost yeah. Eons is this but year. Time, time has gone very strange with the, with the pandemic. And yeah, World After 2019. So, um, so that's yeah, that's when I when I kind of started making my foray into kind of straight sci-fi RPG world. Um, it was really as a um, as an experiment in into um, optimism in a strange way because I was thinking um, I've been making a lot of work about um, about imminent disaster, um, looking at things like. Um, extinction events in my tutorial about um, how to make a short video about extinction or um, the end of the world which was all about um, different types of endings like the the ending of a, a virtual online game or the ending of a life um, and the ending of a kind of political sensibility I suppose um, that's it was it was kind of in response to Brexit and Trump and that sort of massive turn away from a sort of consensus politics, I suppose. And, um, and I, I'd been reading a lot of science fiction, um, Philip K. Dick, Ursula Le Guin, Octavia Butler. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was actually a response to a site. There was a, a, a place called Canvey Wick, which is on Canvey Island uh, in Essex. And, um, in the 19, in 1970, it had been um, chalked up for to be a spot for an oil reserve um, somewhere that, yeah, kind of like the, the epitome of extractivist kind of um, capitalism, really. Um, and instead, it was abandoned because of the oil crash and left to nature for 40 years. And it's now a site of special scientific interest and one of the most biodiverse spaces in, in the UK. So I thought that tale of rebirth was something that could almost be replicated in a fantasy world um and i had been playing dungeons and dragons with my kids for the previous like five years um as a way of trying to get them off the screen um try and kind of create stories together rather than kind of um be in our, our own separate worlds um and Try, tried to mash these things together, um, sort of as a, as a um, 
an extension of a performance practice really um like because i've been really interested in um the use of the voice and how how transformative the voice and words are of our our space and our understanding of the world and of course um role playing games like dungeons and dragons do that so intimately and so well you create with the players around the table um a virtual space together you kind of you all imagine um the entrance to a dungeon you all imagine um a goblin crawling out of the sewer and suddenly you kind of you know through each of your understandings of that space that that space becomes really intensely rich and so um i thought of making a of future world a, a kind of a, a world of where um i don't know collaboration was at the heart of it as a collaborative endeavor so i worked with um, a bunch of role playing game enthusiasts in uh, south end very close to canby wick um, in order to make this game of the space so um, and we, we ended up with the world after and it was really um, at the same time as kind of eulogizing Dungeons and Dragons and that sort of way of role playing. There's also a whole set of um, problematic aspects of it. It's very Eurocentric in its kind of law. Um, it has a, a history of sort of, I guess, misogyny and also um, of um, like genetic determinism, like as though, um, yeah, that, that you're your genetics determine how you act in the world etc there's it's it's um yeah and and even the ideas of things like alignment that things are naturally good or evil and that that we can't do anything about this and that evil things are there just to be killed like it's, it's kind of a useful game trope because it means you can kind of do things with a moral impunity but thinking it through as you know, at, when actually acting inside those games, it starts to become really quite oppressive, really, that that idea that that certain things are just straw men to be be broken down. So so I wanted to try, yeah, rather than kind of just adapt Dungeons and Dragons, I thought, why don't I just kind of create something from the ground up so that it kind of releases it from a lot of those those issues. Um, and so we came up with this idea of the world after, which is um, that humanity after the climate cataclysm uh, that we're going through it has a little timeline in there of the next hundred years um retreats into underground havens um and stay there some for like eight thousand years and in that time uh because of this um magical uh material that is emitted by guy Gaia in response to this climate cataclysm, um, everyone evolves in different ways in each of these different havens, um, adapting to their, to their environment in that space. And then they kind of come back, they're released somehow from these havens after 8,000 years and see the world afresh, kind of, kind of like can be wick after 40 years. It's sort of like suddenly, like without human um, in, interaction, like, um yeah the world's kind of cleaned itself up and it's become this fresh start thing but yeah then you kind of come into contact with the, this new colonialism of the the um ultra um privileged who had gone to mars rather than go into underground havens and and that's kind of the the conflict at the heart of the game um i made this very much like in isolation from the absolutely fervent and disparate um tabletop role-playing community which is like it's just such a huge explosive thing right now um and after making world after i, I kind of yeah started getting into those sorts of conversations joining different discord groups finding out about things like um free creel um role play which is um is the idea of um role play with like the most minimal rules possible this sort of thing it's like it's almost like um yeah kind of like freeform jazz but with, with role play uh, you said that but i thought you'd just go no 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it can be i mean like it's still very it's, it's still structured but it's it's all about kind of um 
about shared consent, about shared um, ownership of a story. It's not, there's not kind of a dictator of the law. There's not a dictator of like where the story is supposed to go. It kind of is much more kind of collaborative in, in, its, in its aspect. And as, as a response to that, I decided to kind of reboot the whole world after thing into Lost Eons, which is a whole new system um, made really in collaboration with a whole group of people from from inside of each these these discord channels and and through twitter and stuff and it's um yeah it's it, uh, but this time it's taking on um the cambridge fens and cambridge fens after sea rise so cambridge becomes a um it's on the shore of the sea at that point because um it's actually kind of if you, you look at the topography of the uk there's there's a huge sort of chasm down that part of east east anglia where and and cambridgeshire which which links all the way to the sea in the north um and yeah obviously like the sea encroaches in various ways around around the uk but cambridgeshire especially is is kind of particularly flood flood prone from the sea um so that changes that and then again i was working in collaboration with, with a group from cambridge there and um we came up with all sorts of different societies that could potentially live in that space um like um yeah there's one which is a librarian um plant race so they're able to craft different bits of their uh, of of other people's bodies onto their own and sort of for um effectively live forever by grafting their um consciousness onto another smaller body it's sort of it almost becomes vampiric really and then there's um also the the cambrians who are, who are sort of crab people which i think i think i've got a picture here uh, on the on the screen with with me <laughs> sort of well yeah <laughs> well just just be i mean what i like about this is like you you'd speak about it as a kind of you know you kind of striving to find some kind of optimism in in this and you know, of course, people within and with outside of, of science fiction just often they think often think of it being as something that channels kind of dystopia and post-apocalypse. I mean, of course, your your games and artworks for Lost, Lost Eons and World After come following a cataclysm, so there is something to work through there. Um, but I, I do quite like this kind of sense of optimism about them. Um, something I wanted to ask you about, you know, this move towards you know, you, you, you speak in terms of it being a, a performance aspect of your work, but when, you, when you're speaking to galleries and gallerists, is this kind of extra element of RPG or role-playing games for anyone who's, who's not sure of the terminology, I'm sure everyone is, um, but is that extra element of RPG on top of the science fiction? Is that, is that a step far for some people in, this, in, this, in the world of contemporary art or are they kind of, they're kind of with you, they go with it? <laughs> So, so far, I think people have been intrigued enough and kind of understood that it's almost, you know, the kind of the speculative fiction aspect of it, the, uh, the collaborative storytelling aspect of it. Um, it's, it means that, um, yeah, that I'm, I'm not kind of precious about the ownership of it in some way. So it, it brings in other people and it makes it very, um, kind of open work um i think it's not you know it's not a a kind of collectible artwork maybe <laughs> like like it's it's a i mean like yeah lost eons it's a zine you know you, you can get it for a small amount of money like like a book or something so it's it's um yeah it's it's I think I think there is a tension between um, kind of a sci-fi sensibility and and the art kind of space. I think there's often um, a need to somehow um, transcend a genre or something, maybe. Um, as and you know, it's fine for things to be referencing things, but if it actually is something. <laughs> I don't know there's there's kind of a difference there like if it was if it was a, a 
picture of you know if i if i made a sculpture of what something from one of these things and put that in the middle of something that'd be like oh that's fine but if it's just a bunch of people playing a role playing game inside a gallery that's maybe a, a step too far you know i mean i ask because obviously you know we've we've spoken a little bit about this and that kind of tension between um science fiction in one world like so let's say the world the, the publishing and literature world science fiction has kind of like i see it as quite a ghettoized um thing that is spoken of as genre fiction mm. and it's very much pigeonholed i think um i mean maybe less so today but I, I think there's still kind of you know issues around around whether an author wants to call themselves a science fiction writer or a speculative fiction writer or something else altogether maybe and I've all, i'm always very interested in the way the art world on as opposed to publishing world kind of is is kind of seems very accepting of science fiction i mean as you say it has to do do more than you know that that first kind of you know superficial this is science fiction in a gallery um for it to be acceptable but you know there's, there's so many artworks out there that you kind of you'd point to and kind of say that's unmistakably sci-fi as far as i'm concerned you know and then on the other hand when you kind of read about works like Chris Marker's Legette, it's it's really referred to as science fiction mm. when you know it's set after World War Three and it has time travel. <laughs> so yeah. I'm really interested in those tensions and questions. I, I, what, I don't know what you think. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, guess I think um, it's part of the thing is that there's a sort of anthropological um, aspect to art making, like um, you know, taking the found object and and turning it around and putting it in in a space, and I think that um, that sensibility kind of lends itself to to yeah finding aspects of popular culture and, and bring them in. It's there's less of a sort of um, anxiety about sort of um, yeah that 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 strict delineation of high and low but at the at the base of it there's an understanding that because it's in a gallery there's sort of a height to it if you want to use those terms um through through sort of the framing um and the you know it's maybe you know the artist acting as as you know bruce lee pointing at the moon and like kind of it's, it's be, being the finger and saying this is an interesting thing to look at you may have disregarded it as trash but actually you know uh delaney's dahlgren is is worth exploring as a thing and as as a, a phenomenon and you know maybe one page by itself is not the best written piece piece of prose that you'll ever read but the piece in its entirety has a, a coherence and and yeah uh, subversion and yeah there's it, so much so much kind of rich storytelling there that that actually speaks to the human condition and isn't that what art is so yeah that's i think um yeah i think there's there's some part of that going on that that people are kind of falling into sci-fi because i mean well, we, and we're living in an alternate universe right now, aren't we? I mean, like, have, like in the middle of COVID, we're, we're all in in little boxes on a on a Zoom call. Um, this is this is sort of a, a future that that Philip K. Dick would have would have made up. Like it's it's um, you know, and even even before that, the kind of cumulative catastrophes from I don't know, yeah. I mean, where do you start? Where yeah. do you start? But it's just, it's just, just kind of snowballed into 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 the now, and and I think there are so many certainties that are just being ripped up and sort of thrown around. That why can't we imagine a better future right now and try and do that through the space that has been doing that for since since sci-fi began? You know the. the arguably different different books but like you know last let's say 130 140 years um like then um to kind of take that those imaginings and kind of yeah turn them into 
into the future we want rather than the future we fear. I think, you know, that's that's a thread that runs through, um, you know, Afrofuturism especially as well. And obviously you've worked a lot with Larry Achampong and, and some of the work that you've done with Larry is kind of informed by that world. Um, I mean, I want to have time at the end to kind of talk about people's um, kind of gateways into science fiction or anything that you're, you're really, really inspired by right now. But I think it, it'd be really interesting to hear from you, David, um, the kind of works that obviously, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and, and, and the generative aspect of that with, with your, you know, playing that with your kids has kind of fed directly into, you know, this collaborative world that you wanted to create with the world after and lost eons. Um, but more broadly, you know, I know your work is very influenced by popular culture in general. Um, you know, what is the kind of, um, to put it in a kind of, you know, it's not, this sounds bad, but this is, <laughs> I don't mean it in a bad way, but what is the kind of David Blandy grab bag of kind of influences and inspirations and... Oh, wow. I mean... I never yeah. intended to say David Blandy grab bag. Um, <laughs> I think that's my next show. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I kind of, I almost did a whole show about it, this thing called Fortress of Solitude, where it was, it was all the things that I'd, I'd experienced growing up, which kind of made me who I am perhaps. And, you know, it's video games like uh, Final Fantasy VII, um, things like Street Fighter. That's not very sci-fi, but it's, it's like, um, it, it's an important reference for me, um, 2000 AD obviously had a, a subscription to that growing up, have huge piles of them in, in, in my attic. Um, things like, um, God, Warhammer 40,000 was like huge. It's like, it's the Games Workshop miniatures game. Um, Aliens was my actually my favorite film when I was about 16. And I think, I think that sensibility of, um yeah the, that um there's a a kind of a corporate manipulation of um action which is kind of at the heart of kind of a lot of horrific endeavor is is that's at the heart of that film and it's kind of it's there in in alien as well and kind of through that through that whole series um and then, yeah, more recently, I'd say Ursula Le Guin's Dispossessed, certainly. Um, the word for world, world is forest. Um, Octavia Butler's um, Parable of the Sower. Um, those things have really kind of, I don't know, hit me in, in a kind of visceral way and made me rethink uh, what, what sci-fi and I don't know, speculative fiction, whatever that means, how powerful that can be. Thanks so much, David. I think um, while we're talking about, you know, all those 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 great novelists and, and influences from the world of science fiction, um, I'd like to bring in um, Basma Galaini, um, editor of Palestine Plus 100. Um, essentially, um, Basma, you know, we, we've been speaking this week and, and one of the things that you were very keen to stress um, even before we kind of um, fortunately confirmed you on, on, on this panel was that you wanted to stress that you, you, don't, you don't feel you're somebody who's kind of an expert from the world of science fiction or speculative fiction. And I thought that that, that would add a really interesting kind of perspective for everyone on this panel who, you know, otherwise probably would, you know, very much say I, I, I definitely am from a kind of world that is filled with science fiction stuff, certainly speaking of myself um, and some of the authors that David just mentioned there, Octavia Butler, Ursula K. Le Guin, um, you know, are on the reading list that accompanies this series. Um, and yet you found yourself a couple of years ago editing Palestine Plus 100. And, you know, can you tell me a little bit about how that came about and some of the book's themes? And also then, I think as an extension of that, this kind of, you know, the reading that you, you bring to fiction like this, um, which is a mixture of speculative fiction, science fiction, future noir as well. And what you bring to that as a reader who doesn't carry with them the kind of science fiction kind of grammar or baggage, I think. Um, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> the way I came across uh, the concept of Palestine Plus 100 was uh, the publishing house that uh, published the book 
had already uh, started a series called the Plus 100 series, where they take a pivotal event in the history of the country and ask the writers to imagine what the world would look like 100 years from that pivotal event. So uh, the first book in the series was Palestine plus a hundred, uh, sorry, uh, Iraq plus a hundred, where the uh, Iraqi writers were asked to imagine the world a uh, hundred years after the invasion of uh, Iraq. And I was doing some work for Comma, for the Comma Press, who were the publishing house. Uh, and I um, and I just approached the uh, uh, series editor and said, look, because the series editor, he was he was a massive science fiction um, fan or nerd or I don't know what the right word is <laughs> um, and he he uh, I said look what we've got Nakba now uh, in Palestine Nakba is the event is, is a pivotal event for Palestinians and uh, to those of you who don't know in 1948 um, uh, 700,000 Palestinians uh, were um, you know kicked out or displaced from their uh, from from their villages, um, 500 villages and maybe I don't know, 11 towns, uh, they were just they were kicked out and replaced by um, Israelis who were um, who had just uh, uh, been suffered the Holocaust and uh, and and the bit there was a build up before that in 1948 it reached full momentum and 700,000 Palestinians were evicted and displaced and uh, re replaced in other parts of the world and within Palestine and. Uh, since that year, nothing has been the same for Palestinians. Uh, it's uh, it's an event that lives in all of us. It it shapes all our lives as we know it. And uh, so I just thought that could be the starting point for the next book in the series. So we can ask 12 Palestinian writers to imagine what the world, uh, ima imagine how they think the world will be or Palestine will be or life for Palestinians will be a hundred years from Nakba. Uh, uh, and the reason, the reason I thought it would be a good idea to use science fiction is, um, the thing about science fiction, in my, in my opinion, uh, is the terminology, it uses like a book, we can use a vocabulary that the West or the colonizer understands, or in, in a way they can use their own, we can use our own vocabulary to explain what's happen, happening to us. So, I mean, just like this conversation now, and a lot of people are interested in science fiction. We thought if those stories used science fiction as a way to um, describe the Palestinian experience, uh, then we're more likely to attract uh, a reader group that, you know, that, that because sometimes with the Palestinian cause, what happens is it, you know, there's kind of an echo chamber created where you're preaching to the converted already. So I'm just talking to Palestinians or pro-Palestinians about, about the cause and trying to explain what happens, but they already know. So if, if, if there is a way to kind of expand that and, you know, reach out to a different group and maybe they can read more on the Palestinian perspective while enjoying you know, potential good science fiction story. Um, so for me, I didn't have any um, science fiction background. I knew, I mean, I'd watched films and um, I'd been very passionate about a lot of films that were science fiction films, but I, by no means did I have uh, any deep knowledge of the history of science fiction and all the different nuances and kind of subgroups and subcategories and clashes. Uh, amongst the fans, that kind of thing. So it helped me, it was like a, it was like a way for me to get those writers to write about the current situation in Palestine, um, but from, from the science fiction lens, which then helps them to describe what's happening without, um, without also maybe uh, being under specific censorship. So it relieved the pressure of that. Yeah. I think, Absolutely, and and I think what um, what you say in the in your introduction to the book, which is a, a beautiful introduction and also a beautiful evocation of of a Palestine that most people kind of won't be familiar with as well. Um, you know, you speak about Palestine through the eyes of older older generations and family members, um, and you talk about using science fiction as a kind of this allegorical world 
um, because if you just told a straightforward story, you know, uh, an audience like myself, for instance, maybe wouldn't kind of like be able to grasp the, the world faced um, by Palestinians today. Um, and then, you know, you also just touched on, you, you know, you mentioned um, potential for censorship. And um, we've, we've spoken in the last couple of days about the artist Larissa Sansor and how, you know, you kind of were led in some ways by, by her work, you know, for, for people who don't know Larissa's, Larissa Sansor's work, she had um, an exhibition at Blue Coat Gallery um, in I think 20, 2015 or 16. And her work is very much engaged with, with, with Palestine and also with science fiction to tell, tell stories in a very similar vein that Palestine Plus 100 tells those stories as well. So was, was there any particular works by Larissa that you kind of you kind of felt I can really lean into this and and this this helps me kind of you know yeah. understand and grasp the situation that I'm... um the the name uh, escapes me but um, there was a video where she used uh, a space odyssey um, the space odyssey theme to to have a Palestinian placing the flag on the um, the Palestinian flag on the moon and saying one one jar, it's one one small leap for Palestine. Oh, the name eludes me of that specific piece of work, but but that was quite. Um, I I only came across Larissa Sansur while I started doing while I was doing research for Palestine Plus One Hundred just to see if there had been any other science fiction work done by Palestinians, and um, uh, so that there was her work and there was also a workshop that that happened in in Birzeit in Ramallah in Palestine, which took place and that was pretty 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 good uh, called uh, Reworlding Ramallah. And I think they used the concept of, uh, I think it was Philip K. Dick's creation of world, world creation uh, to write stories. Uh, so those two, those two um, were, those two works were quite uh, helpful, kind of gave me a bit of a push uh, to know that there might be a movement starting here. And, you know, I might be kind of gaining some momentum to start some form of, I don't know, Ethno futurism, the Arab futurism type of thing. So yeah, uh, it, that did help. I mean, it, it was really interesting to, to kind of have that chat with you about Larissa's work and and see that you kind of coming from your perspective as someone who kind of can see the the value of using science fiction as a language to tell certain stories Absolutely. and, yeah, and yeah. coming across this artist doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, did you find in kind of editing the collection um, a kind of, you know, that that sparked a kind of a, an un, you know, hitherto unforeseen passion for science fiction and speculative fiction and then understanding, grasping better what it, it's okay. Maybe I shouldn't have asked. You that question. <laughs> no, no, no. I no, I um, uh, uh, I it did it did it did. Um, it did it absolutely help me uh, appreciate well you know led me to appreciate the genre more and the fans like the there's there's this massive scene out there that i didn't realize existed i um and and it it did also the writers that were in in the stories that my favorite part of this was that the writers that were in the book they unlocked something a lot of them unlocked felt that they unlocked something and they because initially i got loads of replies when i was approaching writers saying oh i've never done science fiction it's a bit tricky and i was thinking well just give it a go give it a go and then they all did and then suddenly they're realizing that all we need to do is describe our current reality and add some you know technology to it and then we've got a potential science fiction story and I think they also tapped on on something that they hadn't realized that they they didn't really appreciate the genre initially because when you're Palestinian like writing science fiction it's a bit of a it's a bit of a there's a lot of escapism there because you're writing you know a, a, lug, a luxury type of genre you're not writing about what's happening because as a Palestinian you've got all this guilt if you don't, if you don't um, use your work to, to, to describe what's happening in Palestine, then you really feel like you're not, you're not helping or you're not doing your, 
job really so that's why they were hesitant but after after one of the writers got well into it after writing the story um i i would be more into it if i hadn't had another uh baby probably if i had more time to kind of <laughs> but that kind of um yeah uh i think yeah i think it was a very very good experience and i very very much enjoyed it uh, and just enjoyed being surrounded by all those people who are very passionate about science fiction sure. yeah and do, do you think it found that audience and kind of also found an audience who were kind of then had their eyes open to the the, the situation that the book deals with definitely definitely i got i got um in different events i i um I, and this is this is exactly what the aim of the book was, and the aim of that the idea was to tap onto an audience who were science fiction fans, never heard about Palestine, don't know what's happening, but they hear about this new, you know, science fiction book, read it, and then suddenly they've got all those questions about where it's coming from, and and that that and that was my job done. I just felt very happy about that. Yeah. I mean, I can I can attest to it being a fantastic publication and. You know, it works on the different levels that it sets out to work on, um, for sure. Um, so, I think at that point, it's a, it's a good time as as we can now see Chogway Ekpeki on on camera. Um, I think it's a good time to bring Chogway in. Um, thanks, Basma. Um, we'll we'll try, hopefully have time at the end to kind of have a bit of a more of a bit of a round table, although we're over Zoom. Um, so thanks so much, Basma, for your insight into Palestine Plus 100. Um, and I, I want to say at this point as well that uh, we, we, we will hope to have time for questions at the end if anyone has any. Um, so, so do feel free to pop them in, in the chat to open eye. Um, but at this point, um, I want to introduce Chovwe Ekpeki, um, an idea and speculative fiction author who's joining us tonight, um, who basically I, I came across well, I followed um, Chavwe on Twitter for quite a long time, um, but then we had a conversation a few weeks ago over Twitter, which was was really interesting. And I was like, you know, I think you'd be great on this panel. Um, and then subsequently, I've, I've read a bit more of, of, of your work, and I found really interesting Chavwe. Um, um, the 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 story that I read, um, which forgive me if i if i mispronounce the title of the story it's ifi ioku um but it seems in in the first part of that story um that you kind of you kind of borrow from the world of role playing games in in the warriors fighting the beast and i thought that that really that was ac accidentally coincidental with you know and really nice parallel with david's work and i just wondered if i got that right first of all <laughs> So you're, you're still currently on mute, so why? Oh. Yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a classic fancy, you know, setup. Yeah. Uh, the warriors, the hunters. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, hello? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I was still on mute. It feels like it has that kind of, you know, you've, you've kind of borrowed from the game world and, and, and put that successfully into language of science fiction on the page. Um, but then what's interesting about that story is it's kind of, it's, it, it is post-apocalyptic world, but it feels like it's a kind of, you know, it's a, a kind of, there's a tribal element to it. We're in a, we're in a time with, without technology, basically. And we've gone back back to kind of mysticism and myth, maybe. Mm -hmm. And does that theme yeah. run through a lot of your fiction? If you know, for people unfamiliar with your with your speculative work, yes, it does. It does actually. I have um, several stories that are set in the future, but it's a future that reflects the past. You know, which is sort of. Um, um, a result of, you know, the world I live in. You see, the thing about um, art is influenced by your environment, is influenced by your reality, you know. So when we say, you know, imagine disasters, you know, what we sort of do is bring in our current disasters and reflect it for, you know, it's, it's kind of like you said, my 
science fiction tends to reflect its past um, setup, even when it's in the future, you know. And uh, I incidentally or <laughs> coincidentally, I live in a place which has been by a lot of places, uh, by a lot of names, uh, developing the third world, you know. So it, it, it just so happens that while we are supposedly in the future of technology, of advancement, you know, certain people live in a different facet of that future, you know. So my, my work and <laughs> I happen to be, you know, I'll say where I live is one of those type of places. For example, I've, I've basically for three decades without being able to boast of having 48 hours of consistent electricity. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing somebody in New York would probably not believe, you know. I live in a place where people are still dying from diseases that are extinct, that have been extinct since before one in the rest of the world, you know. So, um, you know, the future, there isn't one future, you know, when we talk about, you know, science fiction, science, yes, there's a different reality, you know, for different people and tend to allow my art, my, you know, my literature reflect that different kind of reality, you know, I'm not going to write about um, what, what did they call I mean, people, people here can reality if they want, but, you know, it's not what I see conversant with, you know, you know, and um, there's, there's a lot about the issue that I, I could talk about, but I don't want to come off, uh, there's, there's a certain phrase people use you know, in genre, you know, the, the politics of science fiction or literature general. People talk about poverty porn. People talk about romanticizing suffering. So those writers tend to be careful, you know, because we don't want to get these labels. You know, you don't, we don't want to catch the flag. But the truth is that, you know, so my future tends to reflect you know, a past way of things being, you know, where there's no technology. For example, lacked electricity for majority of, you know, the panel, you know. So when we talk about, you know, incidentally, we talk about disasters and uh, apocalypses, and people tell you they don't want to read apocalypses or disasters anymore because you know, we're in the disaster, you know, and we're living in it, we're living in the apocalypse, and it supposedly makes you know, those stories redundant, but it doesn't, you know, because when we talk about disasters, we're not just talking as in themselves, we're talking about how people react to them, how people create in them, how people live in them, you know, so that, that's what stories do. Stories show you how to live, how to react. It's like it's like a video game, it's a do-over. You know, you, you, you're supposed to learn and and living in a disaster makes it redundant art. Then we would never have stories because we always had disasters. The difference is disasters that affect more people, that affect people in the US, that are people in Europe, that affect people in Australia. So you know, they affect a larger body of people that, you know, so it seems like, but this, you, you know, there are different kinds of disasters, you know, they're personal disasters, you know, talk about someone disabled who has lived in, you know, who has been chronically ill, you know, the, COVID cannot be their first disaster, you know, COVID cannot disaster for them because they've lived in one you know so i i try to make my work, um all these you know little realities you know uh yeah
this 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 sort of futures or present, you know, because unless the world changes radically, you know, and moves in a direction that is more possible, we will always have disasters, no matter how advanced we get, no matter how futuristic the future becomes, you know, we, we won't always have, you know, um, um, crypto punk or, um cyberpunk or you know you know so i i try to let my sci-fi reflect you know all these other and my arts generally um yeah thanks so i think um as you just talked about we'll we'll always have that disasters no matter how kind of technologically advanced we become um i've we've just got a question in which it, which is for everyone actually um which kind of really, really kind of reflects what you've just said, Chauvoy, really. And it's, it's, it's from Quandary123, who asks, I'm interested in how the panelists reckon with science fiction in modern times when advancements in science in just the last 20 years seem almost beyond compre comprehension, especially with works like Palestine Plus 100, which project, projects so far into the future. Um, how does science fiction fit with a reality that seems science fiction itself? Um, so okay. I, I, I think I'll put that first to Phasma, seeing as it, it that asks specifically about Palestine plus 100. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think so. That was the point I was trying to make: is that the reason the reason I didn't need to be a massive science fiction fan to edit this book or or have a knowledge, sorry, in science fiction is because like the the person asked the question uh, said Palest palestine the situation in palestine is already the, the, a setting for a science fiction film or a science fiction story like a dystopian reality like donald said i mean he he only gets um, he doesn't get a consistent electricity you wouldn't get it for more than 48 hours at a time um it's the same situation in palestine you, you're having every day you're getting if on a good day you'll have eight hours of, of, of in Gaza, on a good day you'll have eight hours of electricity, if you're lucky. Um, uh, you've got, in the West Bank, you've got all the checkpoints. Uh, the West Bank is riddled with checkpoints for someone who wants to go from, let's, let's say if you want to go from Manchester to Liverpool, you've got five checkpoints on the way, and in each of those checkpoints, your, 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 your Palestinian ID is checked for a specific number. You, you might make it to work, you might not. Um, there's, there's all types of events that are the making in a Western view of a, a science fiction that have only been described by the West uh, as things that would happen in science fiction films. Uh, there's ghettos, you know, there's refugee camps all over the Arab world where, where Palestinians live in. I mean, I can think of a set, maybe District 9 seemed a bit similar to, to when I watched that film, I thought, oh God, this looks like home, I'm homesick now. But um, so, so to answer that question, um, just adding, some form of random, you know, technology uh, and, you know, parallel universes, some form of new type of physics laws. Uh, no, not new types of physics laws, but, you know, new types, that's a bit out there. New types of technology, and then you've got your science fiction story, because all you need is a dystopian setting after that. Um, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. And, and so, do you, do you think, um, I mean, what, what I really wanted to ask you about as well was um, obviously you're you're a writer in your own right, but you've also got this this book of the year's best African speculative fiction out. This well, it's 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 about to be released. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I guess that deals with some of these themes and addresses these ideas that you've just uh, you know explored about no matter what the tech, we'll always have disasters. Yes. And yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, in it's similar to the Dominion Anthology, in fact, I've gotten a bunch of, I don't know if to call them complaints or just opinions, but yeah, it, it, you know, I tend to hear that African speculative fiction tends to be dark and tends to be a bit about disasters, you know, apocalyptic. You know, reflecting back to his question, 
And I wanted to say that the kind of art that you create, it reflects your background. You know, that is definite. It's a must. It doesn't mean that you will always write about at um, the disaster directly or from a certain point of view. Really that it influences you, you know. It might mean that you write disasters. It might also mean that you definitely, you deliberately pull away from disasters, you know. But that is saying you either by action or by causing you to make an omission, you know. It's kind of the superhero super villain they both suffer the same event their parents are killed and one of them decides i'm going to be the guy that saves everybody that makes sure nobody experiences that and the other guy decides i'm going to be the guy that punishes society for the failure i experienced i'm going to make sure that everybody suffers what i did you know they're both influenced by the same event you know so it's kind of like that you know, for me, when you talk about the, you know, far future, you know, development and all that, you know, like I said, there will always be disasters. There will be a portion of society that doesn't reflect those events, that yeah. supposed future. In the same way that the present is not, you know, the, the current development in the present is not reflected in all demographic. That's where you find me in the cracks you know i would like to show the viewpoint of those people you know some other person where i am i decide they want to write about far future teleportation you know you know but for me i i can't answer i, I can't answer that question because i'll be covering a different aspect of it which will always be there unless humanity has a very radical shift from you know how interact with the rest of humanity for sure so um, yeah thanks job way um so I, I i'm conscious that we're um we're rapidly moving towards the hour mark but i want i want to just bring david in because you you kind of almost kind of began um the evening with, with this perspective you know you you talked about how you know we're, we're seeing these things now we're living this kind of almost alternative reality now um and you know just even for me like um pulling this this program together and and thinking about what i wanted to include in the program it, it as things were happening in real life you know what the situation in afghanistan and and how we kind of try to reflect that and how we try to kind of also, you know, even even kind of absorb that and, and see that and kind of deal with what that means for the world. Um, obviously, from my very kind of comfortable perspective of, of sat here on my couch in no danger. Um, I wonder what you think, you know, the potential of science fiction is to kind of reflect the world we live in right now. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's I think it's impossible not to reflect the times you're living in, and to some extent, and, and the space that you you inhabit. Um, and I was just thinking about Chogri's, um idea about you know a total societal change that is needed to avoid the sorts of disasters that exist. And I was just thinking about the genre of um, solar punk that exists, which is this idea of kind of remodeling. Um, society so that everything is based on kind of um, equitable um, mm -hmm. provision of things and a, um, a yeah total reliance on on renewable energy and sustainable um, crops etc um, and it's it's a it's an interesting part of science fiction because it's sort of um, yeah, it's it's kind of I guess the the hopeful hopeful end of it. It has a kind of leaning towards sort of hippie fantasy, but I think there's there's a there's a kernel in there of sort of um, some of the quasi utopias that that Le Guin would would imagine in a way. Um, but of course, uh, yeah, it's 
um, it's that old adage that it's, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And how do we, how do we kind of keep imagining that <laughs> to, uh, to reinforce it? I think, yeah, science fiction can be a, a very powerful way of um, just almost like um, an artist stepping back from the canvas and looking again at the picture. It kind of gives you a different perspective on things that are happening now. It's like, it's straightforward. I guess allegory in some ways that, that you, you're taking things that, that are existing around you and, and just reconfiguring them slightly as um, Basma was saying for, for, for the book is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, well, I, I think, I think it has a certain, certain power. It can give it a kind of visceral reality that, that may be a straight telling of, a kind of a truth or a lived reality maybe sometimes doesn't because it feels like a news report it feels like um intensely personal and and it it, it transforms it into into something that, that other people can can kind of have an entry point to and i can see see why that um the plus 100 project exists it makes a lot of sense thanks david i mean i know for sure you know my entry into an artist's work like Keith Piper, for instance, was made all the all the easier because of his use of tools and and communication techniques in his work that meant I could understand it. Um, you know, he, he for anyone who's who's, who's who hasn't um, seen Keith Piper's work, um, it deals a lot with globalization. He draws a lot on Octavia Butler's work, um, a speculative fiction author who, if you haven't checked out, um, I can highly recommend. Um, and I think, you know, that allowed me to kind of glean some insight from, from his work that I might not have got otherwise. And I think that's the power of, of, of science fiction when, when sometimes other things fail and might seem glib or trite. Um, science fiction kind of asks us to kind of look at things a little bit in an as skewed way and kind of and see things from a different perspective that actually makes them more able to be kind of become more visible. Um, as I said, we're, we're rattling towards half past, but there is one more question that I think is really pertinent to kind of everyone on this panel um, and, and pertinent to the, to the theme of imagining disaster, um, science fiction type contemporary art. So I'm just gonna, just gonna ask the question and if someone feels like they wanna take it on, that's fab. Um, so, Art Observer asks, um, and first of all says thank you for this event, and um, thank you for joining us. I wonder whether the panelists think visual art or writing is a more successful medium for exploring science fiction. Um, would anyone like to take that on? <laughs> There's lots of shakes of heads. Sorry, come in here, come in here with the question. So Chofoy, the question is um, basically whether, whether art or writing is a more successful space for exploring science fiction and its ideas. Okay. Um, well, I would, I would, um, I would add that, I guess, by saying that um, on a stronger level, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think. Okay. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I, I kind of, as a fan of, of kind of um, writing and visual art, I, I think I, I, I'll kind of weigh in and um, put my two pennies worth in and say that kind of, they, they both are capable of, of doing the same job in that, as I said, just, just prior to, to the question, I think they allow us to look at the world in a slightly different way and to understand um, the issues and challenges faced that is being dealt with, with whether it's visual art or, or whether it's from, from the pen or keyboard of, of a writer. Um, and I think um, I, I wouldn't want to plump for one over another. <laughs> but um, we're, we're just over the, the hour mark now. So I, I kind of, we, unfortunately don't have time for the round table in which I was just going to basically ask you what your favorite science science fiction was and we could have ended on on, on a really nice way there but that'll have to be for another time 
Um, I want to thank David, Chovwe and Basma for joining me tonight. It's been a really quick but fantastic hour um, and a really insightful hour. So thanks everyone for joining me. Um, Chovwe, I know you had real issues joining me. So so thanks so much for, 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 is, for kind of yeah, joining us. Um, and I, I just want to say, if, if you're interested in, in pursuing or, or kind of following the work of either David, Basma or Chavway, or all of them, as I think you should, um, David has um, books out The World After and Lost Eons. Um, Chavway is the year's best African speculative fiction is available to pre-order now. And Basma edited um, Palestine Plus 100, and that's also available now. Um, in terms of imagining disaster, um, science fiction time for contemporary art and um, that's going on for the for the next few days um, and that's a, a wider program um, which you can find new writing on science fiction and contemporary art by the likes of Roger Luckhurst, Glenn Morgan, Stephanie Bailey and myself and you should also head over to Instagram for a takeover of the Open Eye account by black trans artist Daniel Braithwaite Shirley whose practice focuses on recording the lives of black trans people intertwining lived experience, fiction, and interactivity to create work that refuses to let viewers be passive. And you can follow all of that on hashtag, hashtag imagining disaster. So I think we're gonna call it a day there. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Mike.